Thank you. Do not have to be blind. You can steal it from me, huh? Yeah. Sorry, I can get it. Wow, we're already five minutes late. This is going swimmingly. You guys are cool. slowness of this because it's an emulator that's running inside an emulator that's running on my phone. So I'm screencasting from my phone to my laptop, my laptop is screencasting to the projector. So it might be a little bit laggy. That's not because it's a hybrid app, that's because it's like emulated <laughs> twice, okay? Let's not go away with that thought. Anyway, um, first copy, then everything else. I am Simon McDonald. I work uh, within the PhoneGap team. I've been working on PhoneGap since about uh, 2010 when I was part of the uh, team at IBM that uh, joined the open source project. So I'm not PhoneGap original gangster, but I'm pretty close and it looks like some things went poorly wrong. All right, so today's workshop is going to be on push notifications and how to add that to your application. Uh, if you can see the URL there, please go to it now. I've also put it on the sideboard and be, I'm purposely blocking it here with my body. Um, so what we'll be building today is a very simple application that will just show you how to get push integrated into your app and kind of whet your appetite on what you can do with push notifications. Uh, can you zoom in? It's hard to read. Is it hard? Isn't that hard to read? All right, so let's... Tell me when. Uh, actually, no. I was talking more about the URL. Oh, the URL? Uh, yeah, that is a tough one. Just type it into your alpha or something. It's on the board behind you. Yeah, I put the board there and the board here. So, can everybody get to the URL? Has somebody not mm -hmm. gotten to the URL yet? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. So anyway, it won't be a very fancy application, but this will work on uh, Android and iOS. That's what I did all my testing on. Theoretically, it should work on a Windows phone as well, except for I didn't have the time to do all the testing on that. But the push plugin that we will use fully supports Android, iOS, and Windows phone. So hopefully that makes everybody happy. Any BlackBerry fans in here? John, come on, <laughs> don't troll me. Well, I've, I've, I've switched. Do you have the little fan? You have the fan, yeah, you switched to your cell fan. <laughs> Oh, Blackberry. Uh, I wish I had time to go into all that, but I don't. Okay. Oh, well. Sorry? Oh, well. All right. So we're going to talk today about how to handle a number of topics when it comes to push notifications. First and foremost, how to get a registration ID from one of the remote push services, how to handle when a push comes in in the foreground versus a background how to send a silent push to your application so your app can wake up and do some work in the background without your user even knowing. Uh, that's a really great way of updating your app on the fly without any user interaction. Uh, also, there's some cool new UI that we can do with action buttons that are working on both Android and iOS. So 
In order to follow along with this, how many people got the email and already created their Google project ID with GCM? Right. <laughs> and all of you non-Android fans, how many of you went into iOS and got your certificate set up with push enable? Exactly. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> How many of you went to uh, Tim Kim's uh, app submission guideline talk today? Right. So you're the maybe, it's like maybe two or three people that are capable of going and doing that now. So I don't have time to sacrifice a live chicken to get everybody up and running on iOS. Uh, so what I've actually done is there's a couple of useful resources here. I would suggest that we not dive into that because that will take quite a bit of time. Uh, setting up a GCM project is super easy. It's a bunch of mouse clicks. You name the project, or you can just uh, you know take Hungry Fox 8974 from what Google suggests. So getting that up and running super easy. Getting a push certificate from iOS it includes you paying the $99 Apple tax and going through all that fun stuff. So we're just gonna slide on into Module One, and when you guys get home, you can go over this again by yourself. Uh, this will all be in a uh, Git repository. So. And of course, if there's any problems uh, when you're going through this later, just create an issue on the uh, GitHub repo or get a hold of me through Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is all through these slides, so it shouldn't be hard to get a hold of me. All right. So first and foremost, we're going to set up a brand new project for being able to do push. So I'm going to jump over. Oh, this is where I was doing the other workshop today. All right. I have a brand new directory. Can everybody see the uh, giant? I made that. I made that giant on purpose. It's not because I have failing eyesight. <clears throat> it's, it's not a job. All right. So running the phone gap create command, uh, I'm going to create a new application. Going to put it in the PG push directory. Going to give it a bland ID of calm your name workshop push, and then actually name the app PG push. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Creates everything for us. The project is now ready. Go into PG Push, and from that point, we're all set and we're ready to go with our Cordova application or our PhoneGap application. But that only provides you with probably what you've seen a number of times today with the Cordova build bot with the devices ready, green flashing. What we really want to do is go ahead and clone this workshop that I have. I'm going to create a new. So I'm going to clone the workshop. So in this repository, uh, we have the all of the solutions for each step of the way. So we have seven different modules that we're going to go through. Uh, under the solutions directory, there's a triple W1 through 7. So each one of them is the completed example for that module. So hey, things cloned. That's great. So from there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the solution in triple W1. Uh, as well as the commit XML and the icon that we're going to use for this application and copy it into that uh, directory we just created. So, so I put it in workshop, PG push. Window. All right, so PG Push is the one that we created with that phone gap create command. So that's the, the application that we're going to be building. And push dash workshop is all of the code that is on the GitHub repository with all the solutions for us. So if I go into PG Workshop and under solutions and for the triple W folder. I'm just going to take everything that's in here and copy it into this triple W folder. And except for yes, for cleaning, it's not the thing it does. So I'm going to replace everything. Go back. Now I'm going to take the config XML file and the icon. 
and drop them into our newly created application, replacing the existing config XML. Uh, so the reason I'm replacing the config XML is it includes a number of plugins that we'll be using today. And instead of having to go through and adding all of the plugins individually, they're already included in the config XML. So when we build the app, they'll get pulled down automatically. So all right. We've cloned this, we've replaced the contents. So basically what we want to do at this point in time is we want to run the application for the first time. Uh, it'll take a little bit to download all the plugins and build, but after that, it'll be much faster. So if everything works properly, run the advisor window. No, Google, I don't want to talk to you right now. All right. So at this point in time, it's uh, going to go in the background, download all those plugins, do the, the build in Gradle, and then it should deploy it to uh, the phone that I have connected here. So let's see. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't, a short, uh, short workshop for me to go home early. <laughs> Especially me, I've been up since 2 o'clock. Uh, we had a very sugary dessert last night, and I purposely tried to go to sleep as early as possible, and I woke up at 2, and I could not get back to sleep. So if I seem a little hostile, I have reasons. <laughs> what do you mean? That's not the way you are? No, I mean... <laughs> Plus one. <All> right. <laughs> All right. Points. Points there. You are not my favorite. Okay. Yeah, trust me, it's doing something. Doing something. Should have more jokes right now. <laughs> you could sing. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell a Canadian joke. Tell a Canadian <laughs> joke? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe later, because right now it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> so, very simply, what we have here is uh, our framework. Uh, I'm using this uh, CSS framework called Materialize to kind of make it look like uh, Google's material. And uh, I've added the status bar plugin, so you can see that the, the top status bar is the same color as the header. Uh, so that can be used on both Android and iOS. And all it's doing is really getting to device ready. So we haven't, we haven't introduced anything new at this point in time. So the next, so once we, got, once we have this, we have actually completed module one. Yay. Okay. Woo. Yeah. None of you have completed module one because you don't have the necessary info to do it. So, all right. So let's go on. We need to obtain our registration ID. So it doesn't matter if you're on Windows or Android or iOS. You're going to have to get a registration ID. Uh, now we've written the plugin in such a way that it doesn't matter what backend you're connecting to. Uh, you're going to get the registration ID the same way. So. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this code into my www.js.index.js file. And that will be answered right up because we'll have to actually add the uh, project to Adam. So please, no holy wars on which editor is best. Uh, today I'm using Adam, tomorrow I may be using Sublime, so let's go with that. So if I go into our PG push application, triple W folder, JS folder, and then finally index.js. Uh, once we get device ready, which is what we see here, uh, I'm logging at the device ready event, and that's where I'm just switching that div to say that yes, we've got device ready, everything's fine. Please don't hate me for using inner.html. I didn't want to get into using jQuery or any other kind of library to do fancy DOM manipulation. So now we're going to paste in the code in order to be able to do push notification. So what's happening here, uh, where we have push notification in it, you'll notice that we're passing in uh, three objects to it, Android, iOS, and Windows. Currently, Windows, there's no additional parameters that you need to pass to it in order for it to be configured. And I see Joan is kind of squinting, so let's see if we can. That better? Yeah. Yay. Yeah. OK. Uh, iOS, uh, there's a number of optional parameters. You can see there's sound, vibration, and badge. So you can set those booleans so that when the push comes in, if you want a sound play, you set true. Uh, it'll play the default system sound. Now, when you send the push, which is something we can get into later, you can actually send a custom sound along. 
you do the same thing on Android, but on Android, you don't need to set that option at startup time. It just comes along as part of the push notification. Uh, and on Android, we need this thing called the sender ID, which is your GCM project ID. If you don't have that, you're not going to get connected. So I'm going to go over to my other Atom editor, where I actually have the I have an already prepared GCM service ID. I'm going to populate that. So basically, that's just a project ID that you've created on the Google Developer Console that has the GCM APIs enabled. So there you go. It doesn't matter on what platform you're running on, you just call the init method, and once that's passed over to the uh, native side, it'll read the proper object in order to set up its configuration parameters. So from that point, what we want to do is we want to receive the registration event. So we're, we're sending a, an event handler on registration and another one on error. Of course, on error, we're just doing a console log because this is not a fancy app. But on registration, there's a couple of things to mention here. Uh, first off, we're going to output the registration ID because I just want to be able to capture it to be able to be used later when we're sending pushes. Uh, secondly, you'll notice that we are checking what's in local storage to what we have returned. So Apple, Google, Microsoft may decide to completely refresh your registration ID. So every time you start your application, you want to call push in it and wait for that registration ID to come back. Uh, there, there is no guarantee that it will stay the same. It'll probably be the same for a very long time, but they could decide just to completely refresh things and one day you'll just wake up with a completely new registration ID. Uh, so in this particular case, we're not building a server to handle this stuff. But that is where you would add your code in order to send your registration ID to whatever your push service is. So if you're using something like Urban Airship or Push Wush or Device Push or Ionic Push, that's where you would say, OK, hey, I have a new device registration, and I want you to know about it. So when you send a push out to all of my app, all of the devices that are running my app, you have that information. That's, this is basically where you want to update it. Isn't there like an issue where your app gets updated or reinstalled or you lose some of that information, your registration ID or something? Yeah, if you uninstall your application and reinstall it, it's a new registration ID. So then you could have like multiple of something that's registered to a, to a device? Uh, yeah, so what happens in that case, and the, the, the push providers like APNS and GCM have actually thought about this. So what happens is if you uninstall your app, you reinstall it, you've got a new registration ID, but in the database, you have two registration IDs, right? One for an app that's been deleted, one for an app that's currently on your device. When you send the push out, the GCM or APNS will give your server feedback, and it will tell you which ones succeed and which ones fail. And there's different codes for how they've succeeded and how they failed. So you'll actually know that, oh, it's not that we couldn't find the device, it's just that, no, that's not a valid device anymore. Uh, when you're building a server for iOS, there's a, there's a feedback mechanism to do it. When you do it through GCM, it just comes back as part of the call when you send a push. So yeah, there is a way to clean that up in your database. So that's kind of out of, out of scope for what we're doing right now, but it's a really good question. All right, so at this point in time, I should be able to run this application and get back an actual live registration ID from GCM. So let's give that a shot. So again, uh, we're just going to run the command, and we should get a screenshot that looks suspiciously like that. Probably a different registration ID. Yeah, this is where I should have prepared more jokes. Just, just too tired. <coughs> All right, so we're launching up the application. Yeah, and I forgot to change the HTML for that, but we'll do that in a second. So there is the registration ID that's coming back from GCM in this case. So we'll need to save that because it'll become very important later when we actually want to send a push to this device. So I'm just going to make a, a few small changes. One, I'm going to go into the HTML, and where we have device ready, that doesn't really make sense anymore. I'm going to change that to registration ID. <coughs> Is 
you'll see there. Um, so <coughs> at this point in time, we have that registration ID uh, that's in our application. We can see it in the HTML, but we really don't have a good way of being able to highlight that and copy it for later. Uh, how many of you folks are familiar with the Chrome developer tools and the Safari developer tools? Okay, so it looks like it's 50%. Uh, when you're building an application for PhoneGap Cordova, they're just essential tools to use, especially when things are running on your device because you can remotely debug this stuff. Uh, what I'm going to do is just very quickly, I'm going to Chrome inspect devices, and there's our workshop, and we can see that there's the registration event that we opened. So I am just going to save that. And you know what, I'll just put it in as a comment here for later. Super long registration idea. The, uh, uh, the ones for iOS are much smaller. And something to note, if you're using the old uh, GCM ID, uh, the old GCM wrapper, it would just look like this. Uh, anything before the, the colon did not exist. Anything after the colon, that's the old ID. Uh, the stuff that they have before the ID is they now have the new uh, Google Identity uh, Manager. And so that's that's added a little bit of stuff to it. Um, so that way you can tell how, if you, if you take a look at the registration ID, you can, and for an application, you can tell like what version of GCM was actually implementing. All right, so back to the workshop. So at this point in time, We've got the application running, we've got a registration ID, we're on our way. We can actually do something shortly. So module three, we want to handle our first notification. Uh, in this case, I'm going to just uh, put it out on the screen. Uh, again, using Materialize, that's what a lot of those divs are. That's uh, the CSS library. It's kind of going to give it a nice little uh, card look that you would have on uh, any Google application. So once again, it's going to copy this code, go back into the index.js. And so we have a registration handler, we have our error handler. So now we have our notification handler. So we are truly ready to start receiving pushes. Uh, something that I should point out. When the notification handler is called, it's called with that, that data object. And what we've done in the plugin, anybody who's familiar with the old push plugin, the data that you got back, uh, if it was on iOS, Android, Blackberry, whatever, that object was wildly different. So you really couldn't, can, like, you didn't have any kind of consistent API when it came into that. What we've done with the new push plugin is to normalize on uh, five, uh, five properties. One, title, two, the message, three is the sound, four is the count, uh, which you would use to set your badge on iOS, or uh, you would see it in the far right-hand corner of a push notification on Android. It would tell you like how many like, notifications have been sent. Uh, and the last one is a, is a giant bucket I like to call additional data. Uh, and that's if you send any kind of other stuff that doesn't conform to those other properties, it will get put into additional data. And the reason we've done that is so it's always in a consistent place. Uh, because on Android, it used to be like data, payload, additional thing. On iOS, it was in a different spot. So a couple of things that we have there. When we print this out, we'll see that we have the, the title and the message. But then I just have this little flag in there, data, additional data, foreground. And that will be an important thing that we can check in a later module, but basically it's whether the notification was received when the app is in the foreground or when the app is in the background. Because you will probably want to do slightly different uh, handling of the notification depending upon when it's received. All right, so we've got our code in here. We're ready to, we're ready to handle notifications. So I'm gonna run this again. This time Michael's going to tell a joke, and I'm going to drink coffee. So excited! It's worth noting that Simon Bacon has sent you the developer app mobile app you've got on your phone. Oh, 
Oh man, that was that was the big reveal at the end. That was like that was the closer. That's just gonna hit them with that. We'll talk more about it. Steal my thunder. Um, <laughs> that was Michael's joke to just ruin your Yeah, basically, that's his joke is to ruin my day. All right. So now we have the application running. We have a notification handler. Uh, I guess we should yeah, back up using Visor. So once again, we're back up. We call it in it again. We've gotten back exactly the same registration ID. Uh, it hasn't changed in the past five minutes. That's a good thing. Uh, so we're ready to actually send this app a push. So what you can see here is I have these, uh, these lovely screenshots showing you what it would look like if you got a push on Android or iOS. Uh, so that's obviously when the push comes in in the foreground. And if your app is in the background, it's going to look slightly different. So on Android, you may notice that there is a way uh, to control what the icon is. Uh, we don't go over it in this workshop, but if you take a look at the Push plugin, you can do a lot of different things with that icon. Uh, that's considered the small icon. So what Android does from version 5 and greater is it will only show white and transparent pixels. So when you're designing that icon, you want to make sure that you have some transparency in there, because if you have an icon that is all color from like top left to bottom right, it will show up as a white block. And it will not, people will not have any idea that that's actually from your application. And that gray background behind it, you can control the color of what that bubble looks like as well. And beyond that, you can actually specify a large icon. You can use that to send things like, okay, I've got a email message from Michael, so I can actually have my his picture in there, and we can identify that not only it's from this application, but it's from this user as well. So lots of fun things that you can do on Android. Uh, on iOS, unfortunately, you are always going to get the icon of your app. That cannot change. There's no APIs to do that. And another slight difference you may notice, and this is because of the OS, Android shows you the title and the message. iOS only shows you the app name and the message. So that's just a difference in opinion on the way Android and iOS do things, but there we go. So if you were to click on those app, those uh, notifications, again, it's going to open up your app. Our notification handler will kick in, and we'll see these cards. So that's all well and good. You guys trust me. I don't actually have to send the device a push, right? <laughs> well. All right. That's cool. Fine. I'll do it. I don't want it, but I'll do it. Um, so yeah. The note I have at the bottom of this page is that notification handler that we've set up right here in our code. This only runs when your app is in the foreground or if you click on the notification. So if your app is in the background, that's going to get placed in the shade. of your, The operating system is just going to place it in the shade. It's not actually going to call this notification handler in your application. So that's something that trips people up sometimes. They assume that that push just goes right into the app, and the app really takes care of it no matter if it's in the background or not. So by default, only runs when it's in the foreground or when the person clicks on the notification in the shade. However, and this is good news, there is a way to tell the push notification to run in the background. So if you have a particular flag, and we'll talk about that later, it will just send it right through your application so your application can act upon it right away. And again, we, we have a pretty cool plugin called Content Sync. And so if you get a background notification silently, the person's not even in the app, it can go download new assets so that the next time the person logs into the application, they've got a fresh new experience. And they don't have to wait to download that stuff. So it's a very powerful technique you can use. So uh, yeah, I guess we, uh, we've got to send a test notification, don't we? All right, so if we go back over to uh, where I cloned the workshop, so we have the push workshop directory, and in there we have the server directory. And so what I've provided you with are some very basic uh, node scripts for the Apple push notification service and for GCM. So you can use these scripts to start sending test notifications. So the first thing that we need to do is run npm install. And it's going to go off and get the packages that we need in order to run those scripts. OK, that wasn't too bad. Uh, and then 
if you're on, uh, if you're doing a push to an Android device, uh, you're going to need to go into the GCM service JavaScript file and change the uh, sender, the API key, and uh, the device ID. So if you were to go through the GCM project setup, you would have to create an API key, and that will allow you to, so the way that they have it is the, the project ID goes on the device, the API key goes on the server, and that's how they communicate, this kind of, this kind of shared secret. Uh, and then we put in the device ID, and in this case, I'm only going to put in one device ID, uh, but you could make this an array and send the push out to multiple, app, sorry, multiple devices. So I'm gonna do that in just a second. I'm gonna skip over the iOS side because we don't really have time to go through it, uh, but it's relatively the same thing. You would open the APN service.javascript, and then you're gonna add in a couple of files, your certificate and your permission <coughs> files. Uh, they are a pain in the butt to create. Uh, I would really suggest uh, taking a look at Tim Kim's workshop from this morning. It has some really good information in it on how to get that stuff set up because Apple can be a real pain. And even just tracking down the documentation on how to do that stuff can be a real pain. So that'll help you get those files created and then you just put in your device ID. So what I'm gonna do is we're going to add the other project folder. <coughs> so our workshop and our server, I'm going to open that up here. And if I go into GCM, you can see where we have to change the API key and the device registration key. Now, of course, I tested this before I got here today. so. I can just go in here and sneakily grab my API key. Uh, feel free to copy that and use it. It, you know, <laughs> it won't work after today, so don't worry about it. All right, so I pasted in my API key, and now I'm going to go back into index.js, where I just left out, sorry, I left in my device ID. And I'm going to put that in here. Again, huge, huge thing. So this is, again, not a real fancy uh, JavaScript file. Basically all we're doing is requiring node.gcm, setting up a new service, creating a new message, and we're adding two pieces. We're adding our title and our message. Um, and then we just go ahead and call the send command and we have some callbacks registered here. I hate to confuse people, but I'm gonna do it. Um, so GCM originally sent everything as a data in the data bucket. Uh, then they improved on the service, and now they have the data bucket and the notification bucket. So the problem that you have uh, as, as with an Android application, if you just send things in the notification bucket, then the operating system takes over and doesn't ever pass it to the application. It will, it will be in charge of displaying the notification in the shade. Uh, and so if we just send straight notification data, our application will never know about it. So that's why we're using the add data method from node.gcm. So if you take one thing away from this when you go to test it later, use add data. Do not use add notification because it just, it will show up on your device, but you'll never get the callback in our application. So it looks like we're ready to send our, uh, oops, I was in a yeah, there for a second. All right, looks like we're ready to send our first push. Um, bring visor back up. Is there a way to send it to all devices? Yes, of course. Uh, but you need to know all of your registration IDs. So you can see right here, registration tokens is an array, and I'm only populating the array with one device ID. Uh, if you want to send it to everything, then that's where you would put the array of all of your device IDs. However, you can only send on GCM side to 5,000 at a time. So if you try to send to the 5,000 at first, the 5,000 at 10th, those ones will just fall off the edge and Google won't even try to send those. So this is where looking at a push service, uh, there's many out there, Amazon SNS, Urban Airship, et cetera, et cetera, because they've already done all that work for you instead of rolling your own. Uh, I have rolled my own push service twice. I wouldn't recommend doing it. Drink. <laughs> Oh, it's only coffee. Okay. All right. So you can't we're... send to all the devices associated with uh, an app ID? Nope. <laughs> you 
have to know the registration IDs. If you don't know the registration IDs, it will not send them. That is the way that the, both uh, Google and Apple design the system. Have they, they improved the guarantee or still do the same? Yes, very good question. So you are not guaranteed to ever get those push notifications. There is no contract of service when it comes to push. It's They do their best to deliver it, but if it doesn't show up on the device, it's OK. Uh, there is, who was I? Yeah, I was talking to uh, Alex. Uh, Alex Kuhn and I are kind of in here. Anyway, he did a, a really cool hack to guarantee uh, that pushes would actually get to iOS devices, but it would only ever work on the enterprise app store, so it's almost not worth mentioning. And it was basically using the voiceover IP uh, socket to send push notification messages down. Uh, so again, completely non-standard, but it worked. So and they let it go through? Sorry? And they let it go no, through? No, no, uh, Apple will not let that go through. It's only for the enterprise store. So, um, but I mean Apple let it go through? So there's two different stores when it comes to yes. Apple. There, there's the app store that everybody can download, uh, and then there's like enterprise certificates. So you can get away with things that Apple wouldn't allow you to normally do on the store. Okay. Uh, so if you have an enterprise certificate, if you're if you, like you have a company uh, like Adobe and you just want to deploy an app internally, they'll let you get away with more things. Uh, I mean, I'm asking because I was with AAA, yeah, and they were not. Because yeah, AAA would 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 uh, they would send enterprise. They would put out a oh in AAA. Yeah. Uh, enterprises should be okay. If it was going to be a consumer app to anybody, then that's where they usually have problems. Anyway, mm -hmm. we'll swing back around to that. Okay, thing. never mind. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, Sorry. I'm just like it's like half an hour, half an hour. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, where was I? Okay, yeah. Why don't we send a push? So. Cool. So if we do no GCM service, oh, I already sent a push. I didn't even notice that. All right, I'm going to send another one. And there you go. So our notification handler gets called. Uh, what we're seeing is that we've got a new card in there that has our title and our message. And what we're seeing is we have true because the app was in the foreground when the notification arrived. So I bet you the next step is to put things, put our app in the background and send that message again. Oops, that's wrong. Bring the visor back up. All right, so I'm going to send a message again. And what we'll see, I don't know if anybody could hear that, but my phone vibrated. And we have that hello world from GCM. So if we were to take a look, if I was to go back into the application, which I will do, in the push workshop, we still have those, those two pushes, but there's nothing else in there right now. So if I click on the push, it just disappeared. Oh, I have clear notifications, that's true, right. Uh, there's an option on Android so that every time you open the application, it can clear off any push notifications that are in your system tray. Uh, so I'm gonna have to resend that. There it is. It came in. We have our hello world. I'm going to tap on that. It opens up our application. And down here at the bottom, we have the notification handler was called again. But you'll notice that the background thing is set, or the foreground option is set to false. So your app knows that the push notification came in while it was in the background. Again, that's very important for handling things. Assignment? Yes. So you've got success and failures properties there in the push app? Yeah. It seems redundant. Uh, sorry, you mean in the in the in the JSON object that comes back to the push service? Yeah. So I mean, could, does failure mean that the service didn't accept the push, or that it wasn't delivered to the device? No. This is this is coming back from uh, GCM. So success, it was successfully delivered to one application, and then zero failures. So if I was to put in a bad device ID, we would get one success, one failure. Would you get a list of IDs that failed too? Uh, I do believe. That, I do believe it does. I haven't looked at that in a while. Okay. Uh, but there is ways to get feedback from Apple and Google as to which device IDs fail. Because then you push that, then can resend it to yeah. the ones that you know it failed on. Yeah. And you know like, like Web push had like a, a callback function so you could tell what was happening, right? You could resend and so on. So let's actually just test that. 
It's going to say, that's not an ID. So we've just changed our GCM code a little bit. <coughs> and we run it. Yeah, we got one success and one failure. Uh, and we get an invalid registration. So you're not getting that back on the send call, but there is a way to interrogate uh, what is the problem. And it should be either by looking up the, the message ID or the multicast ID to tell you which ones have failed. So yeah, I'm going to get rid of that because I don't want to see a failure every time. If you had if you had five notifications come in while your app was in the background, yeah. and you touched one of them, yeah. Will it launch the app and call that on handler five times, or just for the message you touched? No, it'll just be for the message that you touched. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to copy. This is going to go bad. It's going to go downhill really fast, folks. <laughs> All right. So moving on to our <laughs> module. What I talked about earlier was background notifications. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you really quickly, if we go back into the Chrome Inspector. All right, so the app is currently in the foreground, and I'm going to send it a message. And so what we see when the message arrived, we got that new notification event. So the app knows it got it, and over in Visor, everything got updated. But now if I put that app in the background and send another send another message, so we can actually see that we got a new push notification, but we never get a new notification event in uh, the Chrome Inspector. So our notification handler just wasn't run. And that's normal for the way that we have things set up. What we really want to do is to get that notification handler, whoops, we want to get that notification handler running in the background. So, let's go back over to the next step in this. Find my workshop. So again, we just went in, we took a look at the road debugging sec, uh, session so we could actually see the notification event come up. Did the background one so that we could see that we actually don't get that console log. So now what we want to do is to completely replace our push handler. It's going to look surprisingly a lot like the one that was there before, but there are some important differences. So let me just copy this code, put it in here. And just let me talk about the differences. So what you see for the notification handler, where we go ahead and we just add the card into the, uh, the DOM, that's the same as before. But what you're seeing is this little, this little function down here, app.push.finish. Uh, so what we're doing is we are telling the operating system that we have finished handling this notification. Why do we need to do this? Apple. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so on Android, when your app is running in the background, if you get a push notification and you pass that information onto the app, it'll just run it. No problem. Because Android's running everything all the time. And that's probably why your battery life is not as good. Anyway, uh, on iOS, however, when you tell it to run some code in the background, it's going to give you 30 seconds. That's it. <laughs> if something takes longer than 30 seconds, the operating system goes, hey, your app is misbehaving. Mm -hmm. And it will kill you. So if we don't tell iOS that we're done handling that notification, it's going to go, mm, your app's misbehaving, and it's just going to swipe it off the board. So that's why it's very important to add this in. Again, on Android, that's a complete no off. It'll just call the JavaScript method, and on Android, it knows to go, oh, yeah, that's fine. But on iOS, it's very important because it signals the operating system that you are done processing this push. All right. So now that we've got that, uh, that code in there, we're just going to have to uh, run the app again so it gets updated. So while the app is uh, building, uh, we're going to go in to our GCM service, and we're going to add uh, some stuff to tell it to run this in the background. So I'm just going to copy this. Um, so you can see the, the content available flag. Uh, that's basically an iOS flag, but I decided that I would use the same flag on Android uh, because it's just trying to keep it consistent. 
as much as possible. So I'm going to grab that, go into the GCM service, and right here under the add data, I'm going to paste that in. So when the push notification comes in and we see that content available is set to one, we go, okay, yeah, we want to we want to send this into the background server. Uh, if you were doing this for iOS, you would set no content available is equal to one. So the reason that it's content available in camel case is because obviously you can't have a JavaScript property with a dash in the middle of it. So for the, what actually happens when it gets sent out, it gets translated. I just really went Canadian there for you. You heard that, right? Out. Okay. Uh, it'll get translated into the proper JSON property for you. So what we want to do is reestablish our debug. OK. So now we have Pfizer putting the app into the background. And let's see. Oops. Wrong window. Send that again, this time with content available set to true. The gap's in the background. I have a notification event and success. So the notification event is because the notification handler was called, and the success is that the push.finish was called and it returned successfully. So what's happened is when I go into the application now, that card is already put into the DOM. I don't have to do anything else. So if we go back into the app, Oops, I'm hiding it. You mentioned that. All right. So there we go. What we see is that the card is in there. It's the, uh, the foreground value is set to false because the, the push was received while you're in the background. But we can update our application while it's not even in the foreground. The user doesn't have to have any interaction on it. For this particular example, it's not super exciting. Uh, but if you wanted to do some background processing, say if you had a news app where you wanted to download some new stories to the application while it's not being used, so that the next time the person comes into the app, it's like, whoa, the news is here, it's so fresh, this app is so fast, it must be native. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> Ryan, you had a question? Uh, presumably if it's been force closed. Oh, if you've been force closed, you're, you're pretty much hosed. Um, so that, that's a whole other uh, digression we can get into. Um, so you can't launch. Sorry? You can't launch. Yeah, you can't launch it. Yeah. So what I hope to do, and there's an enhancement request on the uh, push notification plugin, is to figure out when your app has been force closed and to start up the service that is listening for GCM again. So that, fingers crossed, I can pull that off. Uh, so full request for welcome. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, if you force close your app, kind of all bets are off. All right. I know I'm speeding through this because we only have about an hour and 50 minutes. I, I'm assuming lots of people have got to get back on the shuttle and get back downtown. So, so please, cover me with questions. So again, what we've seen there is that we can run our notification handler while stuff is in the background. All right. So the other thing is, uh, which is worth mentioning, if you don't provide a title or a body in your push notification, it's not going to put it into the shade, uh, the notification shader. The operating system will go like, oh, this, this is not for user interaction. So you can effectively send a silent background notification. So you can just signal your app to go ahead and do something without the user ever knowing. And please use that for good, not evil. <laughs> now the hell is it? Use it for evil. It's too much fun. All right. So module six. Uh, we are talking about action buttons. So I think the app that does this best, that handles push notifications best, has to be uh, Gmail. The, many people use the, the mobile Gmail application. You can do a lot of great stuff just from the push notification itself. Uh, many times I'll like see something come in and just like archive it or delete it right away. And that's by using action buttons. So again, we, we have some so kind of, there's a big difference between the way it's handled on Android and iOS. On Android, as part of the push notification, you just tell it what action buttons and what actions you want to take place. On iOS, that stuff has to be set up at startup time. Uh, it has to create all of these different, what they call categories. Uh, they can't be done at a per push basis. So when you call init on the push notification plugin, that's where you put in that information. And then on iOS, when you send a push, you just tell it what category you want it to use. So once again, copying and pasting code. 
That's how we all learn to be developers, right? Just copy and paste out. <laughs> so this time, instead of updating the on notification handler, we're going to change the initialization code. You're going to notice it's going to get a lot bigger. Uh, oops. Yeah, I lost my GCM ID there. <laughs> Bear with me as I tumble all around. There it is. Right. I'll put the GCM back in there so that when I go to do a push and it won't fail. Uh, so you see on the Android side of things, there's no change to the initialization. On iOS, whoa, a lot of stuff changed. Again, sound, vibration, badge, just our booleans. But now we have a new property called categories. And strictly for this, app, for this example, I only needed one category, but I wanted to show you that you can set up multiple categories. Uh, so the one we're going to use is invite. And so you have the invite category, and it has three buttons, yes, no, and maybe. They have to be labeled yes, no, and maybe. Because uh, when iOS is showing action buttons, they can only do three. So, uh, so what's happening, if you click the, the yes button, you tell it what callback to fire off. And in this case, it will be app.accept. Uh, foreground true, that means if you click on that action button to put your app in the foreground. If you say foreground false, it will actually just do the action while the app is in the background. Is not as bad as it seems. Uh, if destructive is true, it just colors the button red to give your user a hint that you may be doing something destructive. Uh, so, for instance, if you're going to delete an email message, you would probably want that button to be red because red is bad, apparently. All right, so we've copied that in there. Uh, we're not going to use the delete category, but I just wanted to show you that you can set up multiple categories here. All right. So a lot of the stuff is explained uh, in the notes here in the workshop so that when you get home later, you'll be able to go through it. And then because we have all these buttons, I need to have some uh, code to be able to handle those button presses. So I'm just going to copy these things uh, into the index.js underneath our uh... oh, that's wrong. I guess it's on. Yeah, we're good. All right, so these are really ridiculous uh, event handlers, but basically, figuring out what button we're going to press, we're just going to have an alert dialog pop up so we can see what happens. But for you, if you were, say, building an email application, uh, you could have the archive button, and you would go ahead and say, just go ahead and archive this email message, or to delete this email message, depending on what button's pressed. It's really up to you. All right, so we've got this all set. And then from there, we need to run the application again to get our new code. Uh, so you may notice, like what Michael talked about, I'm having to go in and do this compile cycle, get the app installed on the device again. Uh, what we're moving towards is that the PhoneGap developer app will have the push plugin in it. And not only that, we're building a service that you can use to test push. So you won't have to go through and do the Apple tax. You won't have to set up the GCM ID. We'll, do, we'll just allow you to send pushes to the developer app, and we'll route them to your application that's running inside the developer app. And uh, we hope to have that you know, in the next few weeks, because I need to move on to something else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the application is running. Uh, now, in order to be able to uh, send these actions along, I'm going to comment out the content available, because <coughs> I, I don't want this to run in the background. So in the GCM service. Just comment that out. And then I'm going to put in this new bit of data, which is our actions. So you can see when it comes to Android, it's a bit different. Uh, you just basically tell it what icon, what the title of the button is, and what callback you want. So you can uh, change what action buttons appear on a per push basis. You don't have to think about it at all before you compile your application. So you have a lot more flexibility on the Android side of things. But 
Essentially, this works exactly the same. The push will have action buttons, and you'll be able to click them, and it will run JavaScript code for you. That's a win. All right. So if you were to do this with the APNS service file, uh, again, you would comment out content available, and then you would set note.category equal to the name of one of those categories that we had earlier. So in this case, I would be using invite, but as you can see in the, uh, the initialization code, we have the invite category and we have the delete category. So when you're sending along the push notification, you could, you could send either uh, invite or delete from iOS. If you wanted to have a new category called party, then you would have to rebuild your app and run on the app store and wait a week and do all that stuff. But you know, so think about what categories you want to have in there. All right, so from this point, uh, we should be okay to send another GCM message here. And bring back up Pfizer. Put the app in the background. You know what I'm gonna do? There's way too many push messages here because I'm a sports nut. Yeah, all right, so send another message using Node. Message comes in, and then you can see there's uh, our accept and reject buttons. So there's no icons associated with them because I didn't bother uh, copying them into the project, but you can associate icons for them. And in fact, you really should. All right, so if all goes well, when I click on accept, it will start the app, and then you will see that alert dialog because that uh, callback is invoked. Yep, okay, that's that's good, things are working. I am, uh... okay, <laughs> all right. So again, if we go ahead and send another push, whoops. So now I sent a push message while the app was in the foreground. There's no action buttons here at all. Your notification handler just kicks off and does whatever it needs to do. So again, if I fire this off, push message comes in, hit the reject button, app starts up, and this time we got rejection. Just like the Golden State Warriors rejected those uh, San Antonio Spurs. Sorry, basketball guys. <laughs> all right. So we're motoring along, we've got 12 minutes left, and we've basically got one module left, and it's hopefully time for questions, and I'm around uh, tonight and all day tomorrow, so please ask me more questions. All right, so what I alluded to earlier is that we may want to handle what happens on a push depending upon if the app is in the foreground or the background. So that's what we're gonna talk about here, and also talk about another popular topic, it's how to redirect to a certain part of my app depending upon data that is in the notification. Uh, so, once again, I'm going to copy the push notification handler and update it in my application. All right, so we have, we have a new push notification handler. So what's happening is you see us checking for data.additionaldata.url. So if there is a URL provided in the push notification, we want to call this method called app.toggle that we're just going to add into the bottom of this file in a moment. And then it's going to switch to another part of the application for us. So let me go over here, scroll down a bit, and grab the toggle. <laughs> It's not an error, that's just ESLint complaining, so I better make it happy. All right, so the internet is built on cat pictures, so in this case, what's actually gonna happen is I'm just going to toggle over to uh, showing a cat picture instead of adding a new card to the application. So our new code is in there. We'll run the application. And while we're waiting for that to start up, uh, again, we have to go in and add the data so that the, the cats will show up. Uh, again, between GCM and APNS, the, the different node packages have a different way of specifying these things, but you can read about it. So going into the GCM service, I'm going to add in our, our cat URL. All right. Let me just double check that I have the index.html that has, yes, it has cats in there. Perfect. All 
All right. So now, when we send the notification with uh, the URL cats, we should actually get a cat picture. Let's fire that GCM service. Ah, I didn't copy the cat photo in. That's right. Absolutely. me. Launching and soon cats. Who's a cat person? Anybody a cat person? Really? Yeah, they suck. <laughs> Advent cats, they all suck. <clears throat> all right, so now we're just going to send that notification and lo and behold, picture of a cat appears. It's great because I'm able to handle that differently. I'm going to close that up. If I go back into uh, GCM, comment that out, send another push notification. In this case, we go back to getting the card behavior. So depending upon what is in the payload of your push notification, different stuff can happen. So that's pretty good. Um, now, there is a problem with this. Can anybody uh, kind of think of what it could be? Oh, not enough cats. Not enough cats. Yeah, no, there's definitely enough cats. Uh, again, same thing, if the app is in the background, so then you click on the push notification, it will see that the additional data URLs there show the cat picture. Um, the problem is, imagine you were running the application and it's somebody is actually using the app right now. So the app is in the foreground. A push notification comes in, just switches to a whole different part of the application. You probably don't want that to happen. That's, that's some bad user experience right there. Uh, so what we want to do is to check to see if the app is running in the foreground or not. And in our case, we're just going to throw up a dialog that says whether or not they want to see a picture of a cat. But in your case, you could probably say, like, no, I'll just uh, alert the user some other way. So once again, grab our giant notification handler. And I probably wouldn't write it this way, but it's a lot easier to uh, just copy and paste. It's all in one shot. I don't advise writing methods that are this long. All right. So now what's happening is we're coming in. We know we have a URL. And now we're checking, are we in the foreground? If we're in the foreground, we're going to throw up a confirmation dialog. And depending upon whether or not they say yes or no to that, we're going to display the cat picture. If they say no, then no, no cat picture for you. So let's give that a shot. Again, run that application. See how I'm set to send the cats. <coughs> All right, so our app is up and running. Send a push notification to it. We get this confirmation dialog. Do you want to see a picture of a cat? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's have more cats. And our cat picture applies. So you can kind of see where you got the power there. Depending upon additional data, you can make the push notification handler do different stuff. And depending upon whether you're in the foreground or the background, you can handle stuff differently. So that is a whirlwind tour of the push notification handler. Uh, a lot of common scenarios that people come across. That is not everything that our push plugin can do. Uh, we didn't even get into playing sounds, getting things to vibrate, uh, all sorts of other fun stuff that the push notification handler can do. Uh, recently, with a 1.5 release, we included the GCM library for iOS. So you can send uh, through GCM to both Android and iOS. Uh, I want to continue to improve that uh, with some CocoaPod support because right now we just dump the entire library into the plugin, which makes it kind of bloated, and I don't like that. Also, people see a whole lot of, uh, oh, perfect timing for that just to cut out. Uh, <laughs> ah, great. Uh, yeah, and you get a, a bunch of warnings there as well, so this doesn't look nice. So, uh, yes? What would be the advantage of using GCM on iOS? Uh, it's a consistent place for you to go send your push notifications. So 
Um, I don't find it as a huge advantage, but a lot of people really wanted it, which is why I added it in there. Uh, typically, if you're using a third-party push service like, say, Amazon SNS, you set up your Apple push, you set up your Google push, then you set up a topic which includes both of them. So you push to the topic, and then the topic pushes to both Apple and Google. So it's not really a hardship, but some people really, really, really want to just push to GCM and have it go out to both devices. Now, the crazy thing is, the way GCM for iOS works as it goes and requests a registration ID from Apple's push notification service first, gets it, and then uses that to request a registration ID from GCM, and then that's the one that you use. So basically all Google's doing is you send, a GCM, you send it to that registration ID, and it goes, oh, that's an Apple one. So then we'll send it to APNS for you. It doesn't get you around the fact that you still need to set up your permission files and your cert files and all that stuff. So it's, I think it's a dubious value, but you know, I, highly opinionated a bit of stuff. All right, any other questions? Yeah? At what stage does it handle, I guess, on iOS, like getting permission to that? Oh, that's a great question. I'm sorry, I, I glossed over that completely. So on iOS, you may be familiar with uh, the dialog that pops up and says, hey, would you like this application to send you push notifications? Um, so that happens at this stage right here. When push notification in it is called on iOS, that's the point in time that you will get that operating system dialog that says allow push, yes or no. Uh, I have a talk on push notifications that describes how to get people to say yes to that more often. And to sum it up for you, it's basically don't let the operating system dialog be the first thing that your users encounter. Uh, for instance, the way that we've written this application where I'm calling in it inside device ready, that's a really bad idea. Because what's going to happen is that app's going to start up. I'm going to get the operating system dialog, and they're going to go. I, I don't even know if I like this app. I'm so, not going to. I'm not going to. I'm going to say no to push notifications. Uh, so what you want to do is let the user experience your app for a little bit. Make sure that it has some value to them, and then give them sort of your own dialogs, like your own flow into like why it would be a good idea to enable push notifications for this application, and then. That's when you hit them with the operating system dialog. You do not want to do that right off the bat. Uh, it's, I think that increases uh, people saying yes from about 50% to somewhere north of 60%. And when you're talking huge numbers, a 10% improvement is, is huge. So, right. so, any other questions? Or does everybody just really want to run after the bus and fall asleep? <laughs>